Okay, welcome everyone to the Herding Cats session. Um, I'm Wilma Hodges, I'll be the moderator this um, session, and I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing Martin Ramsey, who is the Managing Director of the LAMP Consortium. Um, he's also the author of Possum Principles and the Principal Seath Company, um, who's a consulting firm, and they have clients in 13 countries. So um, Martin is going to talk about the 4C model for fostering collaboration. And um, once again, I'm glad you guys could join us. Please do remember to stay muted unless you have something to ask in the question portion. And uh, the session will be recorded and available after the conference. So take it away, Martin. Thank you very much. And um, I, <laughs> I am watching the chat, which is great. Marty has told us that a group of cats is called a clouder. I did not know that. It can also be called a glaring, which is a really great name for a group of cats, especially if they're uncertain about each other. And a litter of kittens is called a kindle. Wow, that's really good information. I had no idea about that. <laughs> that's terrific. Okay. So uh, why do we keep talking about herding cats? I mean, it's a, it's a common metaphor. It's one we use a lot. Um, well, it's because cats are independent and they have their own mind and they can be contrary. I've had cats. You all probably have known cats in your day too. And sometimes what motivates them is puzzling. So what I'm curious about is, does that remind you of anyone that you know? Um, and in fact, let me just ask, has anyone ever tried herding cats? Um, I'm here to tell you it can't be done. Um, at least at what little I've tried to get cats go where I want them to go. Now, I do know something about um, a, a different animal. I know about goats. Um, we, we raise goats and goats do want to stick together. They don't uh, want to be independent like cats do. And yet it's very hard to make them go where you want them to go. Um, instead, you have to lead them. You cannot get behind a group of goats and make them go. They will be contrary and go somewhere else. But if you get in front of them, particularly if you are heading towards the barn with some feed, they'll follow you. Um, and so I, I'm curious to know whether that reminds you of anyone you know either. Um, there's just this idea that, um, you know, how do we get people to go where we want them to go? What, what motivates people is a, is a big question. Now, when we talk about motivation, um, we often talk about the carrot and the stick. You know what I'm talking about here. The carrot is basically an incentive, uh, something that somebody wants to do and so they go for the carrot and the stick is the opposite. It's, it's a kind of a punishment or a, um, a, a negative consequence if they don't do what you want. And when we think about what motivates people, we often think about carrots and sticks. Well, that's not a very useful way of thinking about things, at least in my opinion. And I really like this book by Daniel Pink called Drive. Um, he suggests that the carrot and stick metaphor really only works when you're um, talking about rote tasks. Um, they did a, a fair number of studies, I won't go into them here, but they're quite interesting, um, in which they looked at rote tasks. And with rote tasks, it turns out you indeed can motivate people with, with carrots, incentives, pay, um, and sticks, you know, fear of some kind of punishment, such as maybe loss of job or whatever. Um, but once you get into higher order thinking, anything that's above a rote task, um, carrots and sticks actually are detrimental to uh, progress, to performance, and um, we really have to think in terms of what Daniel Pink calls three, three additional, uh, the, the three ways that we really uh, provide deeper motivation for people, and, and they are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Um, I like those words. I like the concepts. I recommend the book. Um, autonomy means that people are basically independent and can think for themselves. People are motivated by the ability to be autonomous, and particularly those of us who are in the academy uh, can relate to that. Um, in fact, um, with, I hope I don't offend any faculty who are here, but uh, you know, faculty are notorious for thinking independently, and uh, those of us who are in IT um, often have to say, oh, we got to think about how the faculty are going to react to this. Um, but there's this, this notion of, uh, of, of being independent, of being autonomous, is, is something that motivates us. Uh, secondly, there's mastery. We want to learn a skill and be really good at it. Anybody here who uh, is, is able to play a musical instrument, for example, know that it takes practice and there's a certain satisfaction, a certain motivation that comes from being able to master something. Um, the same, I would say, is probably true of, of coding languages. If, you've, if you learn Python um, and learn it well, there's a satisfaction that comes from that. It's motivating. And finally, and perhaps in my mind, the most important one is purpose. Why are we doing this? You know, tell us, tell us the big, give us the big picture. Why, why would we want to do this? What's the important about it? Um, 
those three things make a lot of sense. And it got me to thinking, particularly about this purpose thing. I've consulted a lot uh, around the world with a lot of different organizations. Some of them are quite large and you would know their names if I, if I mentioned them. Um, but we use, we use this model. Um, it's, a, it's a triangle, which implies that at the bottom there are more people like this than there are at the top. But at the bottom of the pyramid, our people are motivated by what we call transaction-based motivation. In other words, if you pay people, they will come to work and do at least the minimum of what is asked of them. So it's a, it's a transactional kind of uh, motivation. Sometimes people are motivated by a leader. That may be their supervisor. It may be somebody in the organization. Um, but people will follow a leader and say, you know, I'm motivated by that. But at the top of the pyramid is a purpose. Um, why are we here? What's important about this? And that's what is perhaps the most deepest motivation of all. So how does this apply to open source communities? Well, um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. What motivates people to participate in an open source project? Um, is it the fear of, you know, if, we, if you don't participate, you will lose your job. No, that's not, that's not how it works. Is it the high pay that you get? for being a part of an open source project. Jacques can relate to this. High pay, right Jacques? No, of course not. Is it getting paid at all? In many cases with an open source project, the problem is no, you don't um, receive it. Um, and, uh, excuse me. I am so sorry, that was a, it was a phone call coming and I couldn't, I had to turn it off. Um, so um, is, it, is it the fact that you're getting paid at all? Is it that you're going to be promoted or advanced? I mean, none of these are making sense for an open source community. And so what really motivates people? Um, is, it, is it great leaders? Possibly. Is it a great mission? Is it a purpose? And I think that's probably what gets closer to what motivates people to, to work in an open source community. Um, so why do people collaborate in open Imperio projects? And, and we have several people on this call. Um, Jacques is part of this, Janice is part of this. I mean, I, several of the rest of you, I know, you know, what, what motivates you is a question that I love for you to think about and, and, and answer for yourself. Um, and, and what I really wanna get at is how can we foster more collaboration? That's really, I think, what uh, is, is the question for the day. By the way, I do wanna point out that David Wiedemann and, and a group of us are gonna be talking about open source health factors. How do, we, how do we know that an open source community is healthy um, during the fourth breakout session later on this today. And so um, I, I encourage you attend, to attend that. I want to I wanna use the LAMP Consortium, which, which I run as a sort of a case study for this. For those of you who don't know, um, the LAMP Consortium is a community of educational organizations. Currently we have 21 members that share a single instance of Sakai. Um, that's an important distinction. It's a single instance of Sakai. Uh, so it's, it's a multi-tenant instance. We also have Big Blue Button. We have Karuta that uh, Jacques is very, is, is uh, instrumental in, Janice works with and so forth. Um, we have other software. It's more than just Sakai, but Sakai is our centerpiece. Um, I'll, I'll admit that. Um, the costs is shared among the members and the consortium provides hosting and support and training and more uh, with, with an idea that particularly for smaller institutions, the technical barriers are often so high that uh, to be able to use products like uh, Sakai or Big Blue Button or Karuta and so forth are just too high for them to climb over. And so we try to reduce those barriers by taking care of a lot of the technical issues um, so that they can, they can do this. Um, and, and finally, uh, we, we, we truly like each other. We're, we're sort of like a family. Uh, we truly want each other to succeed. So that's just kind of a thumbnail sketch of the length. So let me go back to my pyramid model now and, and sort of apply it to the LAMP consortium. If a, a member of the consortium is transaction based, then they're probably going to see us as just basically inexpensive. They'll see LAMP as a vendor. Um, you know, it's, it's a cheap way to get access to Sakai. It's one way. It's one way. It's one motivation. Leader based. I don't like this one. <laughs> basically means that I talk them into joining and staying. Um, and Terry Golightly has told me that I'm apparently quite persuasive. I didn't realize that. Um, but I hope that that's not the motivation that people have. What I hope is that it's because um, we are purpose-based. We truly believe in collaboration. We truly believe in working together. And so I wanted to think about that again um, it, as, as I think about open source communities and, and what really motivates them. I have a little model that I've used for years uh, called the 4C model. I talked about that in the, uh, the write-up of this presentation. Um, but it is, um, 
four words that begin with the letter C and see if these make sense to you. First of all, the way that people can relate to each other is competition. Um, that basically means for me to win, you have to lose. It's a fixed pie. And for me to get my slice, you don't get your slice. Um, th there's a lot of that out in the world today. That's, this, is a, this is a common way that people relate to each other. Um, and, and I'm going to argue that that's perhaps not the way that um, an open source community should work, and I don't think they do. There's a lot of coexistence that goes on, the second C, coexistence. Um, in that case, I just want to win, and I don't really care what you do. Um, so when I think about colleges that coexist, they may be uh, in the same town even, um, and yet they just sort of ignore each other and, and coexist. That's all they do. Moving along the scale, we get to cooperation. Yay. Um, cooperation is a win-win. I want to win, and I'll help you win too, but only as long as I get to win. This is my definition of cooperation. Cooperation means that um, I'll, I, I, will, I will not subjugate my own best interest to yours, but I will help you achieve yours as long as it doesn't make me subjugate mine. So obviously where I'm going with this is collaboration. I call that a win-win-win. Um, I want us both to win, and I want the larger community to win too, even if it isn't my best to win. Um, and, oh, I see that I'm getting all kinds of interesting things in the chat. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll get to those in just a second here. This is, this is good. Um, I want to give you um, what I think of as four cornerstones, uh, sorry, five cornerstones and four dangers um, in this model. And let's see if these make sense. And this is where I would love to start having your input. Uh, let me just uh, take a look here. Terry's talking about potlucks. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, Marty's talking about sharing costs. Is that done equally or based on each member user size? I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so yeah, and Terry's already answered. It's tiered based on, on users. That's, that's great. Thank you, Terry. Um, so let me, let me talk about um, what I think of the five corners. First number one is autonomy. We've already said that Daniel Pink thinks that that is an important uh, motivation, and I, and I agree. So LAMP consortium members are free to come and go, and individuals within the consortium uh, pursue their own interests in their own ways, but they always have a larger community to fall back on. And I've got a nice quote here from Jamie Russell, who just sent me unsolicited um, some thanks from the bottom of his heart for being able to be involved, and he talks sort of about his professional growth and, and so forth. Um, he, he says, I found friends and positive like-minded individuals, and it doesn't happen very often, but it ha happened for me with LAMP. It's a nice quote, um, it, but I think it probably sort of uh, tells the, the kind of um, uh, organization that we are trying to be. Um, secondly, there's the idea of mastery. Many of our LAMP consortium members become experts in their particular fields of interest. Terry Golightly is an expert at accessibility. Um, she's, she's just become a master at that and, and recognized widely as being a, a person who does, does, does that from Johnson University. And she's risen to what I would call a position of leadership within this larger context. She's going to talk about um, later on, on Thursday, uh, thriving as a little fish in the big ocean. Um, and I think that that's, um, I think, think that'll be a really interesting presentation and I hope you'll, you'll plan to uh, attend that too. Um, Yes, I see that there's some confusion about LAMP, um, the, the acronym. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't take credit for the acronym. It was uh, proposed by the Dean of Cumberland College, uh, jo Joe Early, and it stands for the LAMP Learning Asset Management Program. Um, and uh, in hindsight, I kind of wish that we might have chosen something different, but we do like the idea of sort of being light. Um, and so we've used that, that light metaphor quite a bit. Um, one of the things that we're doing about our, our mastery, this is a new thing for us, is our, our monthly webinars, which we've been holding since 2006. Um, but we're going to switch their focus uh, beginning next month. So on July 9th, Eric Green, who's a, a member um, at, at Clear Creek, will talk about competency-based education. And for those of you who are interested in this, they just got their um, SACS approval for a competency-based uh, master's program and they're going to talk about how they're doing it in Sakai. It's, it's a really flipped, flipped over on its head way of using Sakai to, to support this. Each student will have their own course site um, rather than the, them being enrolled in, in courses themselves. And there's so much more. They'll talk about the financial model and all that. I think it's going to be fascinating. And so if you, um, oh, Terry beat me to that too. Thank you. I was going to say, if you want to sign up, um, there, you just, you need to click on this link and, and give us your, your information and we'll get you signed up for that. So, um, that's, that's another thing that we're doing in terms of mastery. In terms of purpose, 
um, it, it almost, we'd be sort of beating a, a drum that's already been beaten so many times, but we really like collaboration. In 2008, we won the Mellon Award for Technology Collaboration, and I really like uh, what Ira Fuchs, uh, who's the chair of the, the Technology Collaboration uh, Committee, said about us. He said, LAMP has shown the higher education community that it is possible for institutions having limited resources to install, operate, and sustain even the most sophisticated software, and he's talking about Sakai there, provided that they work together to meet their common challenges. And that's basically what we do. That's me receiving the award uh, from no less than Vint Cerf, who was the inventor of the IP address scheme uh, that's foundational to the internet. And I was a little bit starstruck, I have to admit, uh, by, by, by being handed that. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that's kind of a, a, about that. But let me, let me go two steps further. One is community. And our keynote speaker, Kathleen Patrick, uh, talked a lot about this concept of together and generous thinking, and I like those ideas. However, um, it, it, she, I wasn't quite sure how she was taking community. It was almost, she used the word placeholder as an alibi for, needing, for the need for solidarity. And that just struck me as there's, there's more to it than that. And I think in the, in the LAMP consortium, we've done that. So um, using the idea of the potluck um, from Michael Feldstein, um, I think that LAMP is a lot like a potluck and our annual LAMP camp, we've ended up calling it LAMP camp. Our conference is more like a family reunion than a conference. Uh, we, we have a good time together. We enjoy each other um, as well as learning from each other. And so there really is a sense of community. I mean, it's not a, it's not a theoretical construct. Um, it's something that we've experienced. Um, and finally, and there were some questions about this in the chat, um, the idea of sustainability, again, Kathleen Patrick, Fitzpatrick talked about um, resources being excludable and rivalrous, and she talked about the tragedy of the commons, and it was almost like it, it would be inevitable, uh, and it seems like it maybe the implication was the LAMP consortium would, would be that way, but, but we've been financially self-sustaining since we went live on April 26, 2006, um, and, and the financial model is simple. The member dues cover costs of operation each year, and there was a question in the chat about um, uh, how, that, how that works. And indeed, there are tiers. The more, the more users you have, the, the higher the cost. So people pay their, pay their fair share is, is the way we like to say it. Um, but let me talk about some dangers too. I'm sort of uh, watching the clock here. Um, danger number one, there's a change in personnel at one of the member organizations. So the person who gets it, the person who understood you know, sort of who we were, gets replaced by someone who doesn't. Typically, that's a dean. There's a new dean in town, um, and uh, that is when that happens. It's a real danger sign that perhaps uh, this this organization is going to not get it anymore, and perhaps uh, start moving down the pyramid, and perhaps even leave the consortium. Uh, this has happened to us uh, more than once, and and it's it's painful. I mean, I'll just be blunt. I I don't like it when it happens. So how do we how do we mitigate that danger? Well. Um, I, I talk about getting people sprinkled, sprinkled with the pixie dust. Um, they, they need to sort of buy into what we're doing. And it's important that people get sprinkled with pixie dust early on um, when, when they become members. So that means uh, personal contact. It means trying to get them to come to the, the LAMP camp, um, you know, using, using various ways to build connections with people. Um, we, we really have, we, we emphasize interpersonal connections and relationships and, and making those thrive. We don't just focus on doing the business. We, we get to know each other as people. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we like each other so much. And one of the things I like to say is that shared experiences build trust. Um, and so uh, we, I, I took a lot of heat for this, um, but um, we have played games and you can see a picture here that I think that's a, Terry, that's at Johnson University, I'm thinking. Um, Anyway, uh, you know, we've, we've played games together and so forth because basically we're trying to build some shared experiences uh, because those shared experiences build trust. It's, it's important. Yeah, Laura says evangelize and that's, uh, that's exactly right. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, and Tiffany, thank you. Loss of institutional knowledge is usually a problem with experienced people leaving an organization in any context. That's right, um, it is. But I, it, it's particularly painful when it's somebody who sort of gets it, you know, they've been sprinkled with the pixie dust and then you have to start with somebody new and try to get them sprinkled as well. Um, so yeah, this uh, change of personnel is, is perhaps the most uh, dangerous thing that, that can happen to collaboration, I think. 
a second danger, and it's related to the first one, is what I would call illusory purpose. Um, the collaborative nature of the consortium devolves into a customer vendor relationship. When I have somebody saying to me, you know, well, uh, oh, um, you know, send me a proposal or you're a, they use the word vendor or something like that, um, that, that troubles me because it means they don't quite get it. Um, they're, they're kind of lower down on that pyramid. And so we try to always keep in the foreground that we are part of something bigger than any one of us individually. It reminds me of the story of the, uh, the stone cutters. You've probably heard this story. You know, you, a, a, a visitor in a foreign land is, is seeing some stone cutters at work and he goes to the first stone cutter and says, what are you doing? And the stone cutter says, I'm making a block of stone. Oh, okay, that's, that's good. He goes to the next one and he says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm making a block of stone that will go into this wall. And so he shows him the hole where the stone he's cutting will fit into the wall. Oh, okay, that's, I understand. And he goes to the third one and the, the third one, he says, what are you doing? And the stone cutter says, I am making a monument to God. I'm building this stone that's gonna go into this wall that's gonna be part of this cathedral. And he points across the field to this big cathedral that's being built. And he sees himself as part of a larger purpose, even though what he's doing is literally cutting stone. And so hopefully our, our folks are kind of like that. They see um, their their day-to-day -day routine things as being part of something much, much bigger. It means that the leaders have to stay on message um, all the time about the, the bigger picture. And the more we can inculcate the collaborative nature of the work into everyone's DNA, the better it will be. So that um, I remember one time I was, uh, it may have been at a Open Aperio conference, come to think of it. I was on the bus traveling from the hotel I was staying at to the conference hotel. Um, and I was sitting next to somebody and they asked me who I was and what I did. And of course, you know, I've, I've got the spiel down pat. And she kind of, her jaw dropped and she said, does everybody at the organization know that? And I said, well, I hope so. Uh, she said, that, that's amazing. People in my institution don't know our history. Um, they don't know our story like you do. And so um, I, I think the idea of, of having it be a part of people's DNA is, is important. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, Laura says, uh, I've been characterized occasionally as being from Sakai, like I'm a sales rep. Yes, yes, exactly. That's, and I'm trying to fight against that. Here's another danger, what I call the bright, shiny object. Someone goes off to a conference, they see something new, often it begins with the letter C, um, and suddenly the organization has to have it. Um, and so you get like this uh, article from a, a student newspaper at one of our members, Sakai sucks. Um, it's really hard to immunize against this. This is, a, this is a tough one. And so I think that the DNA being spread as deeply as possible to as many people as possible is an important thing. Um, and, and also, of course, we have to keep uh, making sure that the product and the customer service are top notch. So that means Sakai has to always be the best it can be. Um, and we have to always be providing really, really great service. And that the consortial events are always focused on the community. I think those are things we have to do. Um, I talk about institutions having the seven year itch um, after seven years of any software, they, they start getting the itch and they start saying, oh, we've got to get something good. Our software is no good. And so they switch. And then seven years later, they're right back at it. I, I keep saying what you need to do is figure out how to make the software you've got work better for you, whether that's a re-implementation or getting more involved in the community or what it might be. Um, this, this is also a danger, um, this, this bright, shiny object. And then there's a fourth danger, and this one is tough to mitigate against. For whatever reason, the member organization fails to thrive and ceases to exist. We've had that happen twice now. Um, St. Catherine College went out of business, uh, I guess it's been about three years ago. If you travel to St. Catherine, Kentucky, where the college is located, you will see a bunch of beautiful, empty buildings. It's a very, very sad thing. Um, I, I don't know how to plan for, to, to mitigate this other than to plan for what if scenarios, what if some failures are anticipated? And frankly, in my role, I'm worried about COVID-19. I keep asking, you know, what percent of your students do you think are gonna be returning this fall? Are you making plans uh, to mitigate um, in case they don't re return? What if your emissions yields are lower than you expect them to be? What if people who were there last year don't come back next year? Um, what if your expenses increase? Ours have because of COVID-19. Um, and I'm just trying to help people think about this. And I like the idea of the resilience network because may, perhaps those ideas can help um, in, in cases like this. But uh, we, we do occasionally lose a member because they just frankly go out of business. And it's, it's sad when that happens. So 
Um, I, I want to just show you what we're doing here. Um, one of the things we're doing is expanding our offerings to even smaller organizations, hoping to reach many more organizations that need the power of Sakai and the collaboration of the community and a cost they can afford. Um, and so we have this new uh, subscription level where even an individual professor just needs, uh, well, I say professor, most of you are, are related to academic institutions, but notice we're, we're aiming at even um, non-academic uh, organizations that just need, they have things they want to teach, they have students that need to learn. So, you know, even down to the individual level or the program level, you know, 50 accounts, five courses and so forth, most of our members are at the enterprise level, but we're finding that we are getting some members at the smaller levels. Um, it's working. We've had an uptick in memberships in the last six months uh, because of this. So this is just another thing we're trying to do to help um, mitigate this idea of, of uh, being a part of a consortium, making it affordable um, and bringing the power uh, to the group. So I am going to end my chatter and instead going to look at what kind of uh, chats are going on and invite you to turn on your microphones and let's have a conversation what you're thinking about and so forth. Um, Yes, <laughs> Wilma sends me these small organizations all the time and I respond to every single one of them. Some of them never write back, some of them do. I lost one this morning, this very morning. He's in the UK. Um, he says, are your servers based in the UK? I said, no, they're in North America. He says, oh, sorry, that's a requirement. So we're not gonna get him, um, but we tried. And so anyway, that's, um, that's what's going on. So uh, what do you, what conversations, what uh, questions, what suggestions, what, what do we wanna talk about in the few minutes we have left? This is where you all turn your microphones on and talk to me. Oh, so Martin, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you yeah, uh, you decided not to do the lamp camp um, this year and to combine it with Aperio, and then Aperio went virtual. <laughs> what did that do to your uh, your planning there? Did you get many lamp folks signed up to attend? Or I don't think we did. Um, we uh, it it I. Mean, I th I felt like we looked really smart because we said we're going to throw in with Open Aperio this year and then COVID-19 hit and so we didn't have to deal with all the stuff that we had to deal with with Open Aperio. I was on the planning committee so I was a part of all those conversations. Um, I've I, seen Dave here and I've seen Terry Smith here. Yeah, so we, we've got a few, Wilma, in answer to your, your specific question, but I, I don't, uh, we, di we didn't get a lot. And uh, so I, I mean, my takeaway is perhaps that while the Open Aperio community is, is wonderful, don't get me wrong, I'm not sure that it uh, helps us build the kind of community that, that we need. So uh, I'll have to talk to everybody and see what they think, but I have a feeling in 2021, we'll have another LAMP camp. It may look differently than the, the LAMP camps we've had in the past, I don't know. We're, we're trying some new things uh, this year, the year being, beginning July 1, because our, our membership year begins July 1. I wanted to go back to the Tiffany's comment about um, talking to students and the main concern is not the LMLs itself, but the instructors who don't use it well. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons that we're trying this, this new approach of having each of our monthly web conferences uh, be about a specific topic. So we're going to ask Terry Golightly to talk about um, accessibility, um, you know, so forth and so on. So Ray says, how many users and courses does a single instance of Sakai support? Um, mm -hmm. We have about, we're roughly 10,000 users right now. Um, we I've have been, been as high as 14,000. 14, yeah. Sorry? I was just saying the same thing. Yeah, we, we've been as high as 14,000. Um, I have lost track of how many courses we have. Uh, there's gazillions, that's the official term. Um, I do know this, in case you don't know, Ray, you may know this, but just it bears repeating that the University of South Africa has 280,000 students in its instance of Sakai. So when somebody asks me about, you know, is Sakai scalable, they're concerned about it and so forth. Well, um, yeah, it's, it scales quite well. I don't think we're going to top out at 280,000. It'd be nice, but no, I don't think that's going to happen. What else? We got 10 seconds, Wilma. 10 seconds, I'm telling you. We're constantly talking about new services, new things that come yeah. up. And we have conversation, you know, who's going to adopt Karuda? And we have three schools using Warp Wire. So uh, new services are a constant. And we upgrade 
our instance of Sakai every year, every upgrade yeah. we're, we're buying into it. So yeah, we stay fact, current uh, and up to date all the time. Uh, in fact, Monday, we will upgrade to Sakai 20. Uh, I think we're going to end up being one of the early adopters. Uh, we didn't intend to be that, but I think that's what's going to happen. Um, and yeah, speaking of Warpfire, by the way, Editorial Freelancers is a member. If you're an editor, a freelance editor, you're a member of this group called the Editorial Freelancers. Well, they have courses they teach all the time. They teach them in Sakai. Um, and uh, they're, they're, going, they're using Warpfire now, Terry. So we've got another. Uh, ah, four. Um, okay. Yeah, Marty says, no fear of going to a .o release. Yeah, I'm going to be honest and say there is some fear. We try to wait for the .1 release, but we had already picked the day. So we're, you know, we're going to tighten our belt, hold on and take the uh, This will be a first time if we do a .o. It will be. That's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have not done a .o before. So I'll have to see about that. Um, yeah, new planning for new services, Matilda asks. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's something that happens all the time. We added Turnitin years ago because somebody brought it forward. We added Warpwire. We added we added Big Blue Button. Um, we added Karuda. Um, well, I think we were a big impetus for the development of Erosite. That's true. We that's true. We were that too. Yeah. So we're small, but we're scrappy, and we're often on the leading edge. All right. Well, we I are out of time. Go. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but you, everybody, for the wonderful questions and the comments. I appreciate it. And thank you, Martin, for a great thank presentation. You. Thank you, Martin. So thank you, Jacques. Good to see you again. <laughs>